We are glad to have you back on the God's Motivation Channel. Church of the Holy Sila in Jerusalem is the most holy place of Christianity. Here took place the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why today, as in the past, the church was a must-be place for all the pilgrims. Since ancient times, a glorious miracle has taken place each year at the Church of the All-Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The miracle is called the Holy Light. Have you heard about it? Maybe yes. But recently, there is a truth that is related to this event shocking the whole world. Are you curious about it? Let's dive deeper into today's video to see what is going on in the church and how terrifying it is. The Church of the Holy Sealer has been the site of miraculous events that have shocked and moved people, inspiring them to repent and pray. The Holy Fire originates as a divine light that manifests on the marble slab covering the stone bed upon which Jesus' body was placed for burial. A miraculous and unexplainable phenomenon, the divine light rising out of the stone in Jerusalem cannot be described in human terms, taking on different hues each year. You know what? The marble slab that covers the tomb of Christ was removed. As the group of scientists and religious authorities had access to the place, rumors immediately began to run around. Some rumors claimed it was possible to perceive a sweet aroma emanating from the tomb, reminiscent of the olfactory manifestations commonly associated with both Marian and saintly apparitions. Secondly, it was alleged that some of the measuring instruments used by scientists were altered by electromagnetic disturbances. As soon as they were placed vertically on the stone in which Christ's body rested, the devices either malfunctioned or broke, or ceased to work at all. But the journalist is much less hesitant regarding the electromagnetic disturbances recorded by the scientists' instruments. The phenomenon was confirmed by one of the scientists authorized to access the tomb. Later, one of the heads of the building and construction team, Antonio Maropolo, indicated that it is really hard to imagine that someone would be willing to put his or her reputation in danger just because of a publicity stunt. Moreover, the journalist testifies to the scientists' surprise during the opening of the slab. They hoped that the grave would be much lower than it was. Previously performed analyses with the instruments seem to have been distorted by an electromagnetic disturbance. It seems, lacking any other explanatory element, that the tomb of Christ indeed affected instruments sensitive to electromagnetic disturbances. However, possible explanations on the motives for such a phenomenon do not fall short of speculation among those who are passionate about the Holy Sepulchre. And needless to say, those speculations range from the most elaborate to the most ridiculous. Only the tomb of Christ, the opening of the slab, and the revelation of the stone where the body of Christ would have rested have demonstrated that the tomb indeed is real, matches the Jewish tombs of the first century. But according to Marie Armel Beaulieu, the essential core of the issue is to be found elsewhere. I would be delighted if a scientific expert proved that this stone was indeed where Christ rested, but even if it were proven otherwise, it would still be a sign of the resurrection. The journalist who has been a resident in Jerusalem for the last 17 years was part of the exclusive privilege group that was granted access to the place. As she confesses, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is a disconcerting place. At first, I did not like it very much. I was expecting a beautiful church, and I found this place of strange architecture, which does not recall anything of the biblical scenes. There is no trace of the Garden of the Tomb, for example, but gradually I developed an attachment to it. During the processions in which I participated, along with the Franciscans, it is not a place to visit, but rather a place to pray. Thanks to a friar, I was able to walk all the way in until I reached the rock that supported the body of Christ something I could not have imagined. I felt somehow weightless, but I remember all the details. I will never go visiting the Holy Sepulchre in the same way. Right now, they have replaced the marble slab on top, and one can only partially see the crypt through an opening protected with a shielded glass. But I know the stone is there. I had the habit of genuflecting before the tomb of Christ, and then I reflected and thought it was absurd, as there was no real presence there and that one should rather genuflect in front of the Blessed Sacrament. But in the Holy Sepulchre, in front of this tomb, there is a real absence, an empty tomb, a miracle before which all knees bend, in heaven and on earth. On earth, Jesus' tomb opened for the first time in centuries. 
The original rock, where Jesus Christ is traditionally believed to have been buried in Jerusalem, has been exposed to the light of day for the first time in centuries. According to an exclusive report by National Geographic, a partner in the project at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the original rock surface has been covered with marble slabs since at least 1,555 and possibly longer. During a conservation project to shore up the shrine surrounding the tomb, a team from the National Technical University of Athens in Greece realized that they would need to access the substructure of the shrine to restore it, said Frederick Hibbert, head, the archaeologist in residence at the National Geographic Society. Some theological historians believe that Jesus was a real man who was born sometime around the year one or earlier in Bethlehem in modern-day Palestine to move to Nazareth in Israel. He is thought to have died around the year 29. The site, venerated as the tomb of Jesus, is encased in structures like a Russian nesting doll. According to the Bible, Jesus was laid to rest on a stone platform in a cave hewn out of a rock wall. In 326, the first Christian emperor of Rome, Constantine, sent his mother, Helena, as a representative to Jerusalem, where locals pointed out one cave among an area of first century burials that was said to hold the tomb of Jesus. Constantine had a shrine installed over the cave. The original top of the cave was removed so that pilgrims could look down and view the cell A, where Jesus' body was said to have rested. This shrine is known as the Holy Aedicule, and it was last reconstructed after a fire in the early 1800s, according to National Geographic. The Holy Aedicule itself sits within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, or Church of the Resurrection, which is a famed pilgrimage site. It's built directly over the cave where Jesus was said to be buried. Another wing sits over the site where he is said to have been crucified. Three sects jointly manage the site. The Greek Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and the Armenian Orthodox Church. 1958, that conservation of the Aedicule was necessary but it took nearly 50 years to agree on a method and to secure funding. There was a moment in which you could see on the faces of the important people of the church a certain happiness that this has actually happened, Hebert said of the conservation. A grid of iron bars installed in the 1940s held the edicule structure upright until the project started. Now, Herbert said, the Greek team, with years of experience, under their belts of shoring up ancient structures like the Parthenon, will inject mortar around the marble slabs that make up the edicule. They've peeled back marble slabs from the 19th century that were in turn covering slabs from the 15th century, covering slabs from the 12th century, which themselves shield the original bedrock. As to whether the tomb ever contained the remains of the historical Jesus, it's a matter of faith. There are no remains to analyze or D, N, A evidence to exhume. We know that Romans crucified people, and that people were buried there in the first and second centuries. It's also known that there was an oral tradition about the site of Jesus' burial 300 years later. When Helena came to visit Jerusalem, did the holy fire miracle occur, true or false? We embark on a journey to explore one of the most controversial and fascinating events that take place in Jerusalem, the holy fire at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Every year on Great Saturday, the day before Orthodox Easter, this ancient tradition captures the attention of believers and skeptics alike. Join us as we uncover the mystery behind the proposed miracle and whether it is true or false. Before diving into the enigmatic phenomenon of the holy fire, let's first understand the significance of the location where it occurs. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre situated in the heart of Jerusalem's old city. The, this hallowed site is believed to house both the crucifixion site and the tomb of Jesus Christ. As such, it is one of the holiest places for Christians around the world. The Holy Fire Ceremony is a centuries-old tradition that draws thousands of pilgrims to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre each year. The ceremony is conducted by the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem, and it is said to symbolize the resurrection of Jesus Christ. According to tradition, a divine flame miraculously descends from heaven and ignites the Patriarch's candle. It, this sacred flame then spreads to the candles held by the faithful, signifying the light of Christ's resurrection. More specifically, the proposed miracle happens as blue light is said to emit within Jesus' tomb, rising from the marble slab covering the stone bed, believed to be that upon which Jesus' body is to have been placed for burial. The light is believed to form a column of fire from which candles are lit. 
This fire is then used to light the candles of the clergy and pilgrims in attendance. The fire is also said to spontaneously light other lamps and candles around the church. Pilgrims and clergy say that the holy fire does not burn them. For devout Christians, the holy fire ceremony is a profound and deeply spiritual experience. They view the event as an undeniable miracle, a divine manifestation of God's presence on earth. Pilgrims often attest to feeling an overwhelming sense of awe and reverence during the ceremony, which reinforces their faith in the resurrection. However, skepticism surrounds the alleged miracle. Critics argue that the holy fire ceremony could be a well-orchestrated illusion or a product of human intervention. Some theories propose hidden devices or techniques used to create the fire artificially. Additionally, the strict control of the ceremony by the Greek Orthodox Church raises suspicions among skeptics. The controversy surrounding the holy fire ceremony has prompted various attempts to investigate its authenticity. Over the years, authorities have restricted the use of cameras and electronic devices during the ceremony, making it challenging to capture definitive evidence, either supporting or debunking the miracle. In the past, there were instances of authorities denouncing the holy fire as a fraud. Pope Gregory IX in 1238 and scholar Adamantius Coriace in the 18th century expressed doubts about its validity. Even Ottoman traveler Evlia Celebi suggested that the phenomenon was a result of hidden monk's trickery. In more recent times, historians and scientists have attempted to demystify the holy fire. In 2005, author and historian Michael Kolopoulos demonstrated that white phosphorus, a naturally occurring substance, could cause spontaneous ignition of candles. This has led some to speculate that the holy fire might have been a result of ancient chemical reactions. The holy fire was not a genuine miracle, but rather a carefully orchestrated event. They revealed that the fire was ignited using regular lighters or natural candles, intended to deceive the believers into thinking it was a miraculous occurrence. Intriguingly, the official website of the Patriarchate removed the term miracle from its description of the holy fire, raising further questions about the event's authenticity. While some believers continue to have unwavering faith in the holy fire, the evidence presented by skeptics raises doubt about its supernatural origins. So, is the miracle of holy fire true? We don't know. But one thing is clear, as visitors to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it is essential to approach the ceremony with an open mind, acknowledging both its historical and spiritual significance, while also contemplating the possibility of human intervention. What is the ceremony of holy light? Most Christians outside of the Orthodox Church know little about the Ceremony of Holy Light, also known as the Ceremony of Holy Fire, but it is one of the most sacred rituals in Orthodox Christianity and dates back to at least the 8th century. Every Easter, known as Pasha among Orthodox Christians, on Easter Saturday, Holy Light is said to miraculously appear in the tomb of Christ inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The Greek Orthodox Patriarch retrieves the light in the form of lit candles, from which the holy fire is passed from person to person gathered in the church, each with a candle, and from there is carried to churches across the world. Tens of thousands of pilgrims from across the world flock to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem to witness the ceremony. The church is packed. The liturgy is so popular that not everyone who wishes to will be able to take part in the liturgy inside the church. Many participate in the courtyard immediately outside the main entrance and even in the streets beyond where metal barriers are placed by Israeli forces to regulate the crowds. The build-up to the ceremony begins at 10 a.m. in the Armenian Cathedral of St. James, where the Muslim Jude family, key holders of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre since at least the 12th century, temporarily entrust the key to the Armenian Patriarch. The Patriarch and other church leaders then process to the Holy Sepulchre, an approximately 10-minute walk. At 11 a.m., the key is handed to the Muslim doorkeeper Nusbi, who opens the door, and those lucky enough to be allowed in throng the church. The atmosphere inside is described as electric, a buzz with excitement and anticipation. Pilgrims carry candles with which to receive the holy light of and from mid-morning. The faithful lift their voices in traditional songs and chanting, led by the Arab Christians, dancing and beating drums. At 1 p.m., silence falls, and the civil authorities make their way through the closely pressing crowd to the Edicule, the shrine around the tomb of Christ. They enter the shrine to check that no source of the fire has been left inside it. They then seal the shrine with wax, 
a ritual that mirrors Matthew's gospel account of Roman soldiers sealing Jesus' tomb to ensure the disciples would not steal his body. The waiting crowd then begins to chant, and Christ is risen, in many different languages, including Greek, Arabic, Russian, Romanian, and English. At 1.45 p.m., the patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church arrives at the head of a procession of clergy. Slowly, they circle the aedicule three times. His ceremonial robes are then removed and checked to prove he does not carry any hidden sources of fire. The wax seal around the shrine is broken and a single oil lamp is taken inside and placed on the stone where Christ's body is said to have been laid. Dressed only in a humble white robe, the Greek patriarch enters the aedicule carrying two bundles of unlit candles. Each bundle contains 33 candles, symbolizing the 33 years of Jesus' life. He kneels before the stone and prays, reciting an ancient prayer passed down through the centuries. Opinion varies on exactly what happens next and whether it is miraculous or not. Some say that light comes down from the heavens through a skylight in the edicule, others that it emanates from the stone itself. Only the patriarch is witness to exactly what happens. When the patriarch enters the edicule, all the lights in the church are extinguished and the expectant, silent crowd waits in the darkness. Sometimes the wait is several minutes long. Other years, it is very quick. When the patriarch emerges from the aedicule, his bundles of candles aflame, shouts of joy erupt from the crowd. The holy fire is used first to light the candles held by the patriarchs of the Armenian and Coptic Orthodox Church, who are at the entrance to the aedicule, and then it's carried out into the crowd. Those nearest push forward for a chance to light their candle from the patriarchs. The flame quickly spreads around the church, passing from candle to candle amid shouts of joy. Over the next few days, the holy fire will also be spread to Orthodox churches across the world as special lanterns are lit for emissaries to carry the flame back to their own countries. A wise man once said, what we believe always remains intellectually possible. It never becomes intellectually compulsive. I have an idea that when this ceases to be so, the world will be ending. That is, in this age we walk by faith, not by sight. By God's design and providence, the world contains no proof that could compel belief by force. Nothing that would prove the truth of Christianity so that faith was no longer necessary to discipleship. Scientific facts can be proven in a lab. For example, if you add fire to gunpowder, this produces an explosion. That is not a hypothesis or a theory. It may be considered a fact. Faith in the explosive result of combining fire and gunpowder is not required. All that is required is that you watch for yourself what happens. The truth of Christianity is not a fact like this. Faith is still and always will be required. That is one of the reasons faith will be rewarded on the last day. That said, the annual miracle of the holy fire in Jerusalem does come rather close to proof. For about 1200 years, every year at the eve of Pasha, a fire is supernaturally kindled in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Patriarch enters the Edicule, the Tomb of Christ, with a bunch of unlit candles, kneels down, says a prayer, and then the candles go out, are supernaturally lit. He emerges from the tomb and shares the light with others. At that time, some candles held by the faithful throughout the Church are spontaneously lit before their eyes, even before the fire from the tomb reaches them. This is called the Holy Fire, and it has been occurring faithfully for centuries. Orthodox take it for granted as a sign of the abiding presence of the risen Christ. Non-Orthodox have been rather more skeptical of the supernatural origin of the fire. For them, the fire is not supernatural at all, but is lit every year by the patriarch behind closed doors, presumably after he smuggled a Bic lighter into the tomb undetected. Throughout the years, skepticism has reigned especially in some Protestant quarters. One English visitor to Jerusalem, John Kelman, wrote in about 1912 that in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, on Easter Eve, the sham miracle of the Holy Fire has been enacted annually for at least a thousand years. For him, it was a symbol of the light of Christ, not a miracle. Rather later, another Englishman, H.V. Morton, wrote the same thing, only more entertainingly. The crowds have been told time and again that the holy fire is a piece of symbolism, but nothing will shake their belief that that on this day it descends from heaven into the tomb of Christ. I thought what an extraordinary thing it was that a frenzied ceremony that might have occurred in a grove of Adonis should have taken place at the tomb of Christ. 
A little later still, yet another Englishman, the Methodist military chaplain Leslie Farmer, wrote after witnessing it that, the superstitious believe that the appearance of this fire is a yearly miracle from heaven. There was a miracle. It was that no conflagration was caused. I stood in my sheltered corner and gazed fearfully at the scene, expecting catastrophe at any moment. What is strange is that both Morton and Farmer admitted that they saw people passing the newly kindled fire over their faces, beards and clothes without being burned, but they offered no explanation. For why this was, surely such a thing cries out for some comment. For the fire was not passed so quickly as not to burn, but was held in place long enough to catch hair and clothes on fire, if it was a normal fire. Film footage of this can be seen here. We note too that, for all Morton's saying that the crowds were told time and again, that it was just a bit of liturgical symbolism, and not a miracle. A recent patriarch said precisely the opposite. That is, he insists that he experiences a miracle every year and does not kindle the fire. One person asked the patriarch about what actually happened in the tomb. The patriarch replied, I find my way through the darkness towards the inner chamber in which I fall on my knees. Here I say certain prayers that have been handed down to us through the centuries, and having said them, I wait. Sometimes I may wait a few minutes, but normally the miracle happens immediately after I have said the prayers. From the core of the very stone on which Jesus lay, an indefinable light pours forth. It usually has a blue tint, but the color may change and take many different hues. It cannot be described in human terms. The light rises out of the stone as mist may rise out of a lake. It almost looks as if the stone is covered by a moist cloud, but it is light. This light each year behaves differently. Sometimes it covers just the stone, while other times it gives light to the whole sepulcher, so that people who stand outside the tomb and look into it will see it filled with light. The light does not burn. I have never had my beard burnt in all the 16 years I have been patriarch in Jerusalem, and have received the holy fire. The light is of a different consistency, fire that burns in an oil lamp. At a certain point, the light rises and forms a column in which the fire is of a different nature so that I am able to light my candles from it. When I thus have received the flame on my candles, I go out and give the fire first to the Armenian Patriarch and then to the Coptic. Then I give the flame to all people present in church. In other words, in the skeptics ask us to believe that the Patriarch is a liar, as have been all his predecessors in that office for the past 1,200 years. That would be a miracle harder to believe, and that of the holy fire itself. Surely in all that time, someone would have blown the gaff and let out the secret of the hoax. And one wonders too, about the hundreds and thousands of worshipers who have testified that their own candles were supernaturally lit at that time. For all that, we of course still walk by faith, and the holy fire is given to comfort and encourage believers, not to convert skeptics. We have our Lord's own testimony that no miracle could do that, even the miracle of someone rising from the dead. But I would like to leave the reader with two questions. Why is it that other religions can offer nothing as compelling as the holy fire, and that this is found in Christianity alone? And why is it that the holy fire occurs only in the Orthodox Church? Do other miracles occur? There have been many eyewitness accounts over the years of pilgrims' candles, miraculously igniting as they waited in the dark church before the patriarch emerged with the holy light. There is also a belief that the holy fire has special properties and for the first 33 minutes will burn without heat, so the faithful can immerse their faces and hands in the flames without being burnt. In 2020, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre remained closed to the public at Easter because of coronavirus restrictions. For however, the ceremony of holy light still took place, with Greek patriarch his beatitude, Theophilos, I, 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 and a dozen or so senior clergy officiating. 2021 saw a welcome return of the faithful, although travel restrictions meant that those present were mostly locals. This year it is hoped that pilgrims from across the world will can once again come to take part in the ceremony and witness what many Orthodox Christians regard as one of the greatest of all Christian miracles, it is also hoped that attempts by the local civil authorities to restrict the numbers able to enter the church will be reversed. The mystery of the Holy Fire Ceremony at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem continues to captivate believers and skeptics alike. While the ceremony holds deep spiritual significance for many, its authenticity remains a subject of debate. Whether a genuine miracle or a well-kept tradition, 
The holy fire is an integral part of Jerusalem's religious heritage and continues to be a source of wonder and intrigue for all who witness it. As you plan your visit to Israel, consider including the holy fire ceremony in your itinerary. Experiencing this ancient tradition can be an eye-opening encounter that leaves a lasting impression on your spiritual journey. We are glad to have you back on the God's Motivation channel. This morning that some say may be proof we're not alone in the universe. A UFO in the form of a bright light is seen descending over the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. The Dome of the Rock, an iconic religious site in Jerusalem, is currently at the center of mysterious happenings that are capturing global attention. Witnesses have reported seeing unusual sights in the sky above the dome. This could mean the coming of the end of times. Witnesses claimed they saw a creature right out of the gates of hell. Join us to witness the incredible footage and hear the unknown stories from those who saw it. And we built a joint underground base on Mars. So, is this object a UFO, a known craft, or a bit of video hocus pocus? Chapter 1 Latest Sightings on the Dome of the Rock Something strange and intriguing has happened close to the Dome of the Rock, making everyone feel a bit uneasy and curious. Everyone is asking, what's going on? The secret to understanding this lies in a never-before-seen event that has grabbed the focus of countless people around the world. We're about to explore the core of this mystery, aiming to reveal the facts about the spooky incidents happening near the Dome of the Rock. So, we're inviting you to join us in this video today to learn more about it. Jerusalem is a city that means a lot to Jews, Muslims, and Christians for a very special reason, the Temple Mount. This hill is deeply important to all three religions. But it's also a source of disagreement, because both Palestinians and Israelis say it belongs to them. Now let's focus on the Dome of the Rock, a breathtaking piece of architecture. Muslims hold this beautiful dome in high regard. It was built by a leader named Abd al-Malik from 685 to 691 CE. How do we know the exact dates? An inscription inside the dome tells us it was completed around 691 to 692 CE, according to our calendar. Standing tall on a vast platform, this dome catches the eye with its octagonal base and shiny gold roof. It's about 65 feet wide and sits on a round base that's held up by 16 supports and columns. Surrounding the dome, there's a set of 24 supports and columns forming a ring around a very important rock. This rock is only partly shown and is protected by a barrier. There's also a set of stairs that take you down to a natural cave right below the rock. The sides of the Dome of the Rock have a unique octagonal shape with each side measuring approximately 60 feet in width and standing 36 feet tall. These walls are not just structural elements. They include windows designed to let sunlight stream inside, brightening the interior with natural light. However, what truly makes the dome stand out are the elaborate decorations that cover both the inside and the outside of the building. The dome is embellished with detailed mosaics and metal plates that catch the eye of anyone who sees them. These mosaics are reminiscent of the art scene in old Byzantine buildings, known for their complexity and beauty. But there's a twist to these decorations. Unlike the Byzantine art that often includes images of people and animals, the mosaics on the Dome of the Rock feature no living creatures at all. Instead, they're filled with Arabic writings, patterns of flowers, and artistic representations of jewels and crowns. It's as if each tile tells part of a story, but it does so without depicting any living beings, relying instead on abstract and geometric designs to convey its message. Looking more closely, the octagonal arcade that wraps around the dome is intricately decorated with Arabic religious texts. These inscriptions are more than just decoration. They're like a story that's been carved into the very walls of the dome, inviting those who see them to ponder their meanings. Over its long history, the Dome of the Rock has seen many changes. Various Islamic groups have taken turns refurbishing and repairing it, each leaving their own mark on this historical monument. For instance, during the time of the Crusades, a simple iron barrier was put up around the sacred rock in the center of the dome. This was done to keep Christian visitors away. 
But later on, this iron barrier was replaced by the Ayyubids with a more refined wooden screen which has remained there up to the present day. This ongoing care and attention to detail in the dome's preservation reflect the deep respect and reverence that people have had for this site across different periods and cultures. With the mystery at the Dome of the Rock only deepening, we peel back the layers of history to uncover secrets buried in time. Chapter 2 The door mission of the Mother of God, the Dome of the Rock, is widely celebrated for its historical link to the Prophet Muhammad's ascension to heaven. However, it's interesting to note that the inscriptions inside the dome don't directly reference this significant event. Back in the 9th century, there were some mentions of the dome's connection to the Prophet's heavenly journey. But it wasn't until the 11th century that this idea really took off and became a popular belief. The exact reasons behind the construction of the Dome of the Rock are shrouded in mystery. The details of its construction and the intentions behind its design are not well documented. It stands out because it doesn't resemble a typical mosque. It's not designed for congregational prayers like most mosques are. This uniqueness sets it apart from other Islamic architectural works. The design of the dome seems to be an attempt to link Islamic tradition with the story of Abraham and other religious narratives. It shares similarities with Byzantine structures, known as martyria, which were circular or multi-sided buildings erected to commemorate significant religious events or the lives of saintly figures. There was a specific building, built in 1992, which was an eight-sided martyrium, and might have served as inspiration for the dome's design. The architects of the Dome of the Rock possibly aimed to rival the splendor of Christian sacred sites in Jerusalem, notably the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, with its prominent dome. Their goal might have been to construct a monument that was equally majestic. The Arabic inscriptions on the dome feature Quranic verses emphasizing the oneness of God and challenging Christian views about Jesus. There's a historical theory suggesting that the Umayyad Caliph ABD al-Malik built the Dome of the Rock, intending to divert the Islamic pilgrimage from the Kaaba in Mecca to Jerusalem due to conflicts in Mecca at the time. However, contemporary scholars largely dismiss this theory, considering it to be influenced by biases against ABD al-Malik present in historical records. Evidence indicates that pilgrimages to Mecca continued even during times of turmoil, suggesting the dome was not intended as a replacement for the Kaaba, but perhaps served other spiritual or political purposes. One idea is that the Dome of the Rock was constructed because of a belief in its significance for the Day of Judgment. Some scholars suggest that its architectural style and ornate design indicate that those who commissioned and built it regarded it as an important site for the end times. This makes the Dome of the Rock significant not only to Muslims, but also to people of other faiths. It is located on the Temple Mount, which is the historical site of the Jewish Temple in Jerusalem. For Jews, the foundation stone found within this area, possibly beneath the dome itself, is believed to be the starting point of creation. Historically, during the times of the Crusades, Christian knights made their base there following the capture of Jerusalem. And the design of the Dome of the Rock influenced the architecture of churches back in Europe. The construction of the Dome of the Rock is often interpreted as symbolizing a monumental event, like the Apocalypse, and serving as a bridge between the divine and the earthly realm. Its construction, appearance, and decorative elements are thought to reflect Islamic and Byzantine conceptions of Judgment Day. For Jews, the Temple Mount holds historical significance as the location of the first and second temples. With evidence supporting this view, not only found in their sacred texts, but also in archaeological findings. A significant earthquake hit the Dome of the Rock not too long ago, which provided archaeologists with a unique opportunity to excavate and examine its base. Surprisingly, during their exploration, they uncovered artifacts dating back to the era of the Second Temple. However, this discovery has only added to the complexity of the historical narrative. As Muslims and Jews each have deep-rooted beliefs and narratives about the site that are difficult to reconcile. It's akin to attempting to complete a jigsaw puzzle with several pieces missing, 
making the situation highly sensitive and contentious on a daily basis. The fear among Muslims is that the Israeli government might one day decide to target the Dome of the Rock using missiles. In an effort to prevent any escalation of tensions, access to the al aqsa Mosque area is restricted for Jewish visitors, especially during significant religious holidays and observances. This precaution aims to maintain a fragile peace and prevent any incidents that could inflame tensions. Further, the situation remains delicate, with historical claims and modern-day fears intertwining to create a complex and challenging scenario for all involved, from ancient enigmas to contemporary turmoil. The narrative shifts to a recent conflict that ignites tensions during a time of sacred observance. Chapter 3. Ramadan Chaos at Al-Aqsa Recently, a very upsetting event happened at the al aqsa Mosque compound, a very important religious place that includes the Dome of the Rock. This happened during Ramadan, a holy month. Things got really tense when a group of Palestinians decided to hide their faces and stay overnight in the mosque area. They started a conflict by throwing stones, firecrackers, and different things at the Israeli police there. This made the situation worse and the police had to use tear gas, stun grenades, and clubs to try to get things under control. This caused a lot of confusion and trouble. During this chaos, some people with their faces hidden went into one of the mosques in the compound. They locked themselves in and kept acting violently, throwing stones at the police from inside. This whole situation made the tension worse and showed how serious the conflict was. During a time that's usually about respect and peace, it was a clear reminder of how complicated and unstable things are at this holy place, especially at a time when there should be peace and spiritual focus. This fight is part of a long and complicated struggle over control of this holy place, which made the conflict even worse. When the violence started, the Israeli police went into the mosque compound to catch those causing the trouble. This was very difficult, and about 160 Palestinians got hurt. One of the injured was a security guard who was hit in the eye with a rubber bullet. The chaos affected everyone. Unexpectedly, four women, 27 children, and even a journalist were among the injured. The Israeli police got hurt too, including one officer who was seriously injured. This all happened despite an earlier agreement that Aqsa compound overnight during Ramadan. This leads to the question, why did the Palestinians break the agreement? Why did they do things that put themselves and others in danger? They were really scared. They were worried that if the Israelis took full control of the site, they might be kicked out of an area important for their religion. This makes us wonder if their fears were valid. Was there really a need for violence? Can this conflict be solved without violence? To understand this, we need to look at why this site is so important for both Jews and Muslims and understand its historical and religious value. The area known as the Temple Mount is very special to both Jewish and Muslim people. It's closely linked to their religious history and traditions. Its importance started about 1,000 years before Christ, when King David, the ruler of Israel, took over Jerusalem and made it the country's capital. He had a big dream for this place. He wanted to build a temple there, a holy place to keep the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant isn't just a box. It's very sacred, especially because it held the Ten Commandments, which are very important and form the foundation of the Jewish faith. The story of this place shows the strong historical ties and deep spiritual connection both religious communities have to it. It helps us understand why the Temple Mount is a topic of argument and why the fear of losing access to such an important place of worship can lead people to take extreme steps. The importance of the Temple Mount goes beyond history. For followers of both religions, it's a real expression of their faith. This place isn't just land. It's a symbol of dedication and a point where their historical and religious stories meet, making it a key part of their spiritual identity. This deep connection shows why the Temple Mount is more than a historical site. It's an essential part of the religious life and heritage for Jews and Muslims, representing a sacred space they both share, but also fight over 
influencing how they interact and behave towards it. In the aftermath of the conflict, a groundbreaking discovery beneath the dome promises to rewrite the chapters of our shared history. Chapter 4. Secret Chambers Revealed Beneath the Dome Step into a fascinating mystery that really challenges what we think we know about history. This mystery highlights a discovery that is both amazing and shocking, creating a sense of wonder and respect in even the most experienced experts and fans. Hidden beneath the famous Dome of the Rock is a secret room, a hidden place full of old knowledge that has been kept secret from the world for many years. As researchers look more closely and uncover more details, they find objects and historical items that are hard to explain, giving us a glimpse into an old world that is mysterious and difficult to understand completely. Imagine finding an old manuscript, its pages turned yellow and worn out over time, covered with symbols that are unlike any known language. The significance of this discovery is as deep and mysterious as the sacred place where it was found. Finding such a room filled with historical treasures that have been missed for so long raises many questions about our past, how we understand knowledge, and the mysteries that have lasted over time. It makes us think again about what we believe about history and opens new ways to explore our shared history. This secret room, hidden under one of the world's most respected religious places, gives us a real connection to the past that not many other discoveries do. Each item, each mysterious thing found there, is like a piece of a puzzle in the huge picture of human history. The discovery under the Dome of the Rock is truly amazing and a bit overwhelming. It's not that it's a physical danger, but it completely changes how we understand history. The secrets hidden under this famous place make us question what we have always thought was true in history. We are at an important point in the study of archaeology and history, dealing with the fact that the stories we have been taught might not tell the whole truth. This new information is shaking the foundation of our knowledge of history, making us question what we have always thought about the past. Finding these secrets under the dome of the rock changes everything, making us doubt what we were sure about in our history. It shows that the story we thought was complete might actually have more to be discovered. Even though the Dome of the Rock is usually seen as a peaceful symbol, a shocking and worrying event happened there not long ago. In a surprising incident, snakes came out from under the temple during a prayer gathering, causing fear and panic among the people praying. This unexpected event during such a holy time has left those who were there feeling shocked and worried. The appearance of snakes at this time makes us think deeply about what they mean. In religious books like the Bible and the Koran, snakes often have meanings related to death, danger, and evil. They bring out a basic fear in people, representing not just physical poison, but also the idea of something that can cause harm or corruption. In the story from Genesis in the Bible, the snake is shown as a symbol of Satan himself. This creature is portrayed as good at tricking people, leading them away from the right path. This image is similar to other parts of the Bible, where Satan is often described as an old serpent. Even though snakes are usually seen as symbols of trickery and evil, in some cultures they are seen as symbols of rebirth, change, and positive transformation. In the Christian faith, the initial image of the snake as a symbol of human temptation and downfall is changed by Jesus Christ's teachings. In this new light, the snake becomes a sign of healing, being saved from sin, and a new spiritual start, which reminds us of resurrection and new beginnings. This new way of seeing the snake, as both a sign of danger and a source of hope for healing and starting over, adds a complex layer to how it is seen. Especially in religious stories like the one at the Dome of the Rock, the two meanings of the snake make us think more deeply about its importance pushing us to really explore its deeper message and what it means. When talking about spiritual battles, people are often encouraged to think of themselves as fighters, facing invisible dangers that hide under sacred places, much like poisonous snakes under a place of prayer. They are asked to join together in fighting the bad influences around them. In these stories, Jesus Christ is shown as the greatest hero, bringing peace and unity among people. His work is seen as having a wide effect, going beyond Jerusalem to other holy places, 
including the Kaaba in Mecca. However, how people see Jesus' actions differs a lot between different religions. Some see his teachings as a way to connect different groups, while others might not pay attention to these messages because of differences in religious teachings, even with different beliefs. The warnings Jesus gave about the coming of an evil leader, often called the Antichrist, are important to many. These warnings are a call to stay alert and come together to face future challenges. This idea highlights the need for being aware and working together, no matter what religion you follow, underlining a common theme of being ready and supporting each other when facing dangers. It's a reminder that, despite our different beliefs, we all share the need to get ready and face hard times together, emphasizing the idea of unity against possible threats. As we look deeper into this mystery, the sky above Jerusalem shows us something that makes us question what we believe and doubt. Chapter 5, UFO Sightings Over the Holy Land Whoa! On the chilly evening of January 28, 2011, an extraordinary event was observed in the skies of Israel. A person noticed an unusual formation of lights, often called a UFO or unidentified flying object. As they kept watching, they saw a group of lights forming what appeared to be a bright orb hanging in the sky. Amazed by this strange phenomenon, the observer managed to record it on their camera. For roughly 20 seconds, this enigmatic light descended closer to the earth, floating just above some buildings. Then, it shot up into the night sky at an incredible speed, reminiscent of the speed of light. This odd occurrence happened right above Jerusalem, and more specifically, over the Dome of the Rock, or the Temple Mount. This place is of great historical and religious importance to Christians, Muslims, and Jews. It's famous for being the location of many key events in the Bible and the Quran. Like when God tested Abraham to sacrifice his son, Solomon building the first temple, Jesus confronting the money changers, and Prophet Muhammad's ascension to heaven. Interestingly, seeing unidentified flying objects, UFOs, in Jerusalem's sky isn't a rare event. In fact, it's quite common. Residents of Jerusalem are often seeing these strange objects in the sky. There's a new report of such sightings every year, leaving everyone puzzled about what's really happening up there. In 2022, an American drone in the Middle East captured something unusual in the air, a shiny metal sphere-like object. What's fascinating is that these UFOs are not always visible to everyone. Those attempting to record these objects on their smartphones are frequently left disappointed, as the footage is usually blurry. It seems our phones just aren't capable enough to capture clear images or videos of distant objects in the sky. When videos of UFOs over a renowned landmark in Jerusalem began circulating online, people were curious about who recorded these mysterious clips. The unknown identity of the videographer led to a lot of skepticism. Usually, if someone witnesses something truly unusual, they're quick to share it with others. But the anonymity of the person who recorded these videos has led to much curiosity and doubt. Some people even think that maybe all these videos were made by the same individual. This theory casts a significant doubt over the authenticity of the videos. One would expect that a person who saw and filmed such an extraordinary event would be eager to share their story with the world. The entire situation has raised numerous questions and curiosity about the nature of these sightings. It's not just about who filmed the videos. What's even more mysterious is that it seems only those who recorded these events witnessed the lights. The Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem is a well-known and holy site, attracting many people daily including tourists interested in religious history. However, despite the potential for thousands of people to be nearby when these videos were taken, no one else has claimed to have seen these bright lights, making the whole scenario even stranger. In one of the videos, a woman remarks on the intensity of the light, saying it was almost painful to look at. But here's an even stranger detail. The light didn't seem to illuminate the golden dome directly below it, this peculiarity has led some to speculate that the UFO light might have been digitally added to the video later. Adding a simple light effect to a video is much easier than creating a detailed UFO with complex features, like windows or shadows. 
This ease of manipulation makes the videos seem even more dubious. The debate over these Jerusalem UFO videos is fierce, with people firmly on both sides. Some believe the videos are real, while others are convinced they're fake. The believers haven't provided more convincing evidence than the skeptics. In scientific discussions, it's not enough to simply say something is untrue. If you're going to dispute a claim, you need a better explanation that fits all the evidence. This principle is what makes the debate around these videos so intense and complicated when you take a closer look at the videos that are said to show a spaceship from another world. You can see that the spaceship looks quite small. It's especially tiny when you compare it to the big dome that it's supposed to be flying over the spaceship that people are talking about is only about 15 feet long. That's very small for something that is supposed to have come from far away in space experts, like Robert Schieffer, who has spent a lot of time looking into reports of UFOs, are sure that these videos aren't real. Schieffer has found clear signs that the videos were altered using computers. The person who created these videos added effects to simulate camera shaking, which is easily noticeable at the edges of the video. This kind of alteration suggests that the video wasn't simply uploaded directly from the camera. Instead, it was modified using advanced software. When someone is skilled at editing, they can make it appear as though anything they imagine is truly happening. This raises significant questions about the authenticity of the videos. Since their release, there has been considerable debate about their veracity. Some individuals are eager to prove the existence of UFOs and vehemently assert that these videos are authentic. However, when skeptics pose challenging questions, believers often struggle to provide substantial evidence to support their claims. This has led to extensive debate, with each faction maintaining their own perspectives. Despite all the discourse, no one has been able to provide definitive proof that would conclusively settle the argument. Transitioning from celestial phenomena to earthly disputes, the stage is set for a final confrontation over the most contested piece of land in human history. Chapter 6, The Battle for Sacred Ground. The phrase abomination of desolation is a term from the Bible that describes a period of extreme hardship and persecution. It's specifically mentioned in the book of Daniel and also by Jesus. It signifies a time of intense evil and destruction. This term is linked to a key moment in prophecies about the end of the world. It involves placing something very offensive in a sacred place, which leads to a lot of shock and sadness. When faced with such difficult times, many Jewish people hold on to the hope that the Third Temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. This isn't just a wishful thought for them. It's believed to be the completion of prophecies from long ago. For Christians, this future Third Temple is also very important. They believe that Jesus will return there, which is a crucial event in their faith. At the same time, Muslims are looking forward to this place because they believe it's where the Mahdi, a highly honored figure, will emerge to establish justice and peace. The plan to build the third temple, where the Dome of the Rock currently stands, a holy site for Muslims, causes a lot of conflict. This situation involves a mix of history religion, and politics. It affects not just individuals, but also the relationships between countries. It forces us to recognize and respect the different views people have, as we try to find common ground in a world that is very connected. Is what appeared by the Dome of the Rock a sign of otherworldly intervention? Or a marvel of natural phenomena yet to be understood? What implications does this event hold for our understanding of the universe and our place within it? We are glad to have you back on the God's Motivation Channel. A strange sight in the sky last night over Ohu caught the attention of the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ will victorious return to earth again. God's Word says the second coming of Jesus will be personal, visible, and glorious. When the bells rang, signaling that the final moment was getting closer and closer, people panic and fear when witnessing a series of events fulfilling prophecies in the Bible. We see the drying up of the Euphrates River, the fierce wars going on in Middle Eastern countries. The natural disasters that have brought about terrible disasters in Mecca and the rebuilding of the Third Temple. 
It seems that the angels brought God's light and love back to the human world to save miserable people during the Great Tribulation. Could the angels' appearance be paving the way for God's return? Can humans be saved? In today's video, let's find out the answers to these questions. Watch till the end to not miss any important things. There have been numerous strange sightings in the sky, sparking debate about divine signs, extraterrestrial beings, and the possibility of weather manipulation or teleportation. Many strange sightings in the sky, including angel-like clouds and figures, spark debate about divine signs and extraterrestrial beings. A large hovering figure mistaken for Jesus was speculated to be a water spouter angel, and flying humanoid figures were seen in the sky, sparking speculation and debate. From those comments, people immediately think of signs of the return of Jesus. Could these sudden appearances be signs of his return? Why do they think that? It's because the Bible mentions the signs in the sky when Jesus is coming. After the heavenly signs are witnessed in various parts of the earth, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew chapter 24 verse 30 says, says then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Those who never took heed of these warning signs will be in terror at the appearance of Jesus Christ. But Jesus promised the faithful. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Luke chapter 21 verse 28. For those who take heed, God provides a way of escape from his wrath. So now let's dive deeper into the Bible to see what it says about angels and the signs of God's return. What does the Bible say about angels? Angels are personal spiritual beings who have intelligence, emotions, and will. This is true of both the good and evil angels. Angels possess intelligence, show emotion, and exercise will. They are spirit beings without true physical bodies. Although they do not have physical bodies, they are still personalities and occasionally take on physical forms because they are created beings. Their knowledge is limited. This means they do not know all things as God does. However, they do seem to have greater knowledge than humans, which may be due to three things. First, angels were created as an order of creatures higher than humans. Therefore, they innately possess greater knowledge. Second, the angels know what God's Word says. Third, angels gain knowledge through long observation of human activities. Unlike humans, angels do not have to study the past. They have experienced it. Therefore, they know how others have acted and reacted in situations and can predict, with a greater degree of accuracy, how we may act in similar circumstances. Though they have wills, angels, like all creatures, are subject to the will of God. Good angels are sent by God to help believers. Angels are an entirely different order of being than humans. Human beings do not become angels after they die. Angels will never become and never were human beings. God created the angels just as he created humanity. The Bible nowhere states that angels are created in the image and likeness of God as humans are. What do angels look like? There are several descriptions in the Bible of angels appearing in their glory. In Daniel the 10th chapter, we read the prophet Daniel's description of Gabriel. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Of the angel that rolled away the stone from Christ's tomb, we read the following. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. If you wonder about the question, are angels real? Yes, angels are real and not made up by our imagination. In Genesis chapters 18 and 19, we read of the appearance of angels to God's servant Abraham. The angels of God may appear and disappear at will and yet are real beings. Do angels appear to people today in the Bible? 
Angels appear to people in unpredictable and various ways. From a casual reading of scripture, a person might get the idea that angelic appearances were somewhat common, but that is not the case. There is an increasing interest in angels today, and there are many reports of angelic appearances. Angels are part of almost every religion and generally seem to have the same role of messenger. According to modern reports, angelic visitations come in a variety of forms. In some cases, a stranger prevents serious injury or death and then mysteriously disappears. In other cases, a winged or white clothes being is seen momentarily and is then gone. The person who sees the angel is often left with a feeling of peace and assurance of God's presence. Another type of visitation that is sometimes reported today is the angel choir type. In Luke chapter 2 verse 13, the shepherds were visited by a heavenly choir as they were told of the birth of Jesus. Some people have reported similar experiences in places of worship. This experience does not fit the model so well, as it typically serves no purpose other than to provide a feeling of spiritual elation. The angel choir in Luke's gospel was heralding some very specific news. A third type of visitation involves only a physical feeling. Elderly people have often reported feeling as though arms or wings were wrapped around them in times of extreme loneliness. God is certainly the God of all comfort, and Scripture speaks of God covering His wings. God is still as active in the world as He has always been, and His angels are certainly still at work. Just as angels protected God's people in the past, we can be assured that they are guarding us today. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. As we obey God's commands, it is quite possible that we may encounter His angels even if we do not realize it. In special circumstances, God allowed His people to see His unseen angels so God's people would be encouraged and continue in His service. However, we must also heed the warnings of Scripture concerning angelic There are fallen angels who work for Satan and who will do anything to subvert and destroy us. We are encouraged by the knowledge that God's angels are at work. In special circumstances, we might even have one of those rare personal visitations. Greater than that knowledge, however, is the knowledge that Jesus himself has said, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus, who made the angels and receives their worship, has promised us his own presence in our trials. What are the heavenly signs mentioned in Bible prophecy? Jesus Christ and the Apostle John described terrifying supernatural signs in the sun, moon, and stars between the Great Tribulation and the Day of the Lord. Why will God send these signs in the end times? In the Olivet Prophecy in Matthew 24, Jesus Christ prophesied some important end time sign. Immediately after the Tribulation, the unprecedented time of trouble described earlier in the chapter of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. John expanded on this theme of heavenly signs under the inspiration of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 6 verse 12 through 17 records the sixth seal. I looked when he opened the sixth seal and behold there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as a sackcloth of hair and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. As a fig tree drops its late figs, when it is shaken by a mighty wind, then the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who's able to stand. Through the ages, mankind has been fascinated by the heavenly bodies, sometimes worshiping them, sometimes reading portents in them. The usual events such as eclipses and comets sparked fear and were seen as signs of impending disasters. But modern man has mapped the heavens and calculated the eclipses and orbits of comets. 
What would it take to get people's attention today? Likely it will take the awesome spectacles Christ foretold. The heavenly signs he mentioned will be clearly supernatural, and they will fulfill numerous prophecies of the Old Testament. A brief survey of heavenly signs. Jesus' description of a darkened sun and moon falling stars and the heavens being shaken would have struck a chord in the minds of his audience. So would John's record, which included the element of an earthquake. Such events were described many times throughout the Old Testament in connection with the time called the Day of the Lord. Isaiah's vivid imagery also talks about people hiding in the rocks from the terror of the Lord. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted on that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Human pride has always been a stumbling block to the incredible relationship God offers us to be his children. Pride destroys our other relationships as well, leading to untold suffering and heartache. But seemingly the only way to break through a hardened shell of pride is to shake things up a bit. So that is what God will do. In the midst of this traumatic time, people will finally see the worthlessness of their idols, which they will throw to the moles and bats. While this includes actual idols, charms, and religious objects, the Apostle Paul equates idolatry with our modern pastime of greed and covetousness. Our cars, entertainment centers, and other toys can be the focus of our attention and affection today as much as a household God would be in a different society. Finally, the greedy desire for more and more things will be seen as the pointless goal that it is. Isaiah addresses the day of the Lord again in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9 through 11. See, the day of the Lord is coming a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. This time tied into the darkening of the stars, sun, moon, Ezekiel also describes heavenly signs in his prophecy and lamentation for the Pharaoh in Egypt. The darkness mentioned here is reminiscent of the ninth plague brought on Egypt at the time of the Exodus. And in the end times, it seems darkness will also play a part in softening up the hard hearts of a world too long under Satan's sway. Joe also pinpoints the time of these heavenly signs. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Why a wrathful lamb? So why will God send the heavenly signs? Their purpose is to prepare for Christ's return in his kingdom. Our loving God must wake this world up and expose its evils, including pride, idolatry, and greed, to bring this world to repentance. But still, it can seem shocking to hear about the wrath of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 6, verse 16. They call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The word picture produces a stark contrast. It's hard to imagine a cuddly lamb as angry. Why is our loving Savior described as coming in wrath? Part of the answer is seen a few verses earlier in the opening of the fifth seal. Here, saints who have been martyred just because they serve God are pictured as crying out to God. Revelation chapter 6, verse 10 says, As some day they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? God's anger is righteous and controlled and it is justified. Even his anger is motivated by love. This world is destroying itself with perverted thinking and depraved actions. Christ compared the end time with the time of Noah. Matthew chapter 24 verse 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
In Noah's day, humanity had descended to the depths of evil that worsened from generation to generation. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. God is grieved at all times to see those he created to be his sons and daughters destroying themselves. But at key times and places in history, his grief and righteous anger and his controlled power and endless love demand action. The God who created humanity and who can bring us back to life expresses tough love when that is all that will get through to us. He did it with the world of Noah's day and with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he will do it again in the next few days. Why does God hate sin so much? It goes against everything he stands for and it has brought every evil and suffering on the world. When God's ways are practiced in the kingdom of God, the world will know true peace and happiness. All tears will be wiped away and all sorrow will be comforted. Sin and its evil effects must be banished forever. We see this emphasis to watch made again, this time in the book of Revelation. Christ speaks of the seven plagues that will come on the earth just prior to his second coming. Revelation chapter 16 verse 15 says of behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Garments or clothing are used throughout Revelation as a symbol of spiritual faithfulness. Those who are spiritually faithful, not deceived, are depicted as wearing white robes or robes that were washed clean with the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ says in Revelation chapter 16, verse 15, Blessed is he who watches. This means far more than just looking for signs in the heavens for Christ's return. We need to keep an eye on events in the world around us, and most importantly, be on guard against religious deception. The return of Jesus Christ will happen quickly and unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. There is very little we can do about political, military, and environmental events around the world. By the time the signs in heaven begin to appear, it will be too late if we've been spiritually deceived. What we can do now, however, is watch. This command to watch from Jesus is an important one. Keep a close eye on your own beliefs and how they align to what the Bible teaches, and you will be watching just as Jesus instructed. We see this emphasis to watch made again, this time in the book of Revelation. Christ speaks of the seven plagues that will come on the earth just prior to his second coming. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15 says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Garments or clothing are used throughout Revelation as a symbol of spiritual faithfulness. Those who are spiritually faithful, not deceived, are depicted as wearing white robes or robes that were washed clean with the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that one day, the angels are going to witness Christ's return to his people. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, the Lord predicted that the angels would not only be witnesses, but they would actually be participants in Christ's return. He set when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. The angels will not only see, but they will also participate in the event that is the heart cry of every true believer, the return of Jesus Christ. So where are the angels right now and what are they doing in Revelation 5? The answer to that question is clear, right now. The angels are encircling the throne where the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is seated and they are crying out with praise. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Where are the angels? They are in heaven. What are they doing? They are worshiping Jesus Christ. They are adoring him. They are submitting to him. He is the epicenter of their affection. Now here is a simple question for us to consider. Who has a better grasp of the way things really are? The angels in heaven or us? Who really understands reality? James chapter 4 verse 14 says, Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. That you and I are like vapors. 
We appear for a little while on this earth and then poof, we vanish. And yet you and I, if we are honest, tend to live our lives as if this world is all that there is. And for the few years that God gives us here on the earth, what do we spend our time doing? We worship our jobs, we worship our money, we worship our relationships and our families, we worship our pleasures, we worship the things of this world. But think about the angels. They see things as they really are. They have seen the whole story of Jesus Christ from beginning to end. And what is their response? They fall down and worship Christ. He is the center of their lives. He is the center of their affection and attention. Right now the angels are worshiping Christ just as we should be. How do we worship Christ? How do we make him the center of our lives? We worship him by receiving rather than rejecting the gift of salvation that he came to provide. We worship him by saying no to those temptations that constantly assault us. We worship him by bringing to him not token gifts, but our very best gifts through the church for which he died. We worship him by saying, not my will, but yours be done. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Well, that's all about today's video. If you enjoy this video, please give us a like and subscribe. Your support will be our motivation. And don't forget to turn on the notification bell to update the latest video from our channel. Hope to see you in the next videos. Goodbye and God bless you.